Tonight we are in Ruth chapter 3. And so the short 20 second reminder, Ruth, or let's just start out, Ruth was a woman from where? Moab. Moab. And they were the best friends of Israel, right? No, they were the enemies of Israel, and yet Israelites went there. Naomi and her husband and her boys went there, married Ruth and, so, and Of Ophrah, I believe her name was, and all of a sudden, the both sons died, and the women had to choose to come back with Naomi or not, because Naomi's husband had also died. So all three men had died. And if you remember that Ophrah, she decided, nope, I'm not going to go. I'm going to go back to my people, which was the safe smart decision from just a straight uh, intelligence perspective. But Ruth had developed such a wonderful relationship with Naomi that she was willing to go back to Israel with Naomi to the town of Bethlehem, even if it meant living in poverty. But we're going to see how the providence of God was moving among these wonderful people. How just when they got back to the town of Bethlehem, what season was it? barley season right and so those of us in you know 2022 they may may not mean a lot but back then that was huge because they had been in a famine and god had brought rain and, and right the right temperatures and the right atmosphere and they were able to have a wonderful barley crop so this woman went from a place of absolute famine having lost her husband her sons and just bringing ruth back how in god's providence she came back at just the right time for God to take care of her. Now, before we get going in Ruth chapter 3, I wanted to break down just a term for us. Two, two terms, in fact. The first term is providence. And I heard a really nice definition of it. It may not be the perfect definition, but it's a good definition. It says, God weaving natural events into the supernatural for his glory. So in other words, the very basic things we do with life, the natural things we do with our, 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 our life. I get up, you know, I get my kids ready for school. I decide that I take them to school and then I go in and I'm, I'm part of the Sips Club at Panera. So I fill up my cup with some iced tea and I head into work. That's a normal thing. And that's just normal part of God's providence working on our lives. Have you ever sensed God was just with you in the daily part of your life? That's just the normal providence. Now, a miracle is when God's supernatural ability just shoots in to the daily providence of our lives. And I hope to some extent, all of us have at least experienced a little of that. So him bringing up the sun in the morning, that's his providence. Him all of a sudden healing someone or doing something supernatural in your life or mine, that's when his miraculous power enters in. Now, is God in the miracle? Yes. Is God in the providence? Yes. So we understand how we get frustrated because we're always wanting to see the miracles. Amen? And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's nothing sinful about that. We want to see miracles in our lives. But we must not overlook how he's working in the daily providence. And that is what the book of Ruth, if anything, it screams that truth at all of us. That God is working in the mundane, everyday things that we almost take for granted as just happening. Do you think God would care about you enough to make sure you hit a couple green lights along your way onto work? Yes. yes. Is that providence or miracle? Depending on the road. No, just kidding. <laughs> if it's blanding, then you know it's a miracle. Other than blanding, we know it's providence. And so we are to give thanks to God for the simple providential things that are part of our lives. And we also give thanks to him for those moments of miraculous when he jumps in and he makes a difference in our lives. The word providence is an interesting word because it gets broken down in two Latin words, pro and video, and it means to, be, to see before it happens, which means that God is aware. Do you think God knew what was going to happen to Ruth before it happened? Yeah. Did God know that Ruth was going to lose her husband? Yeah. Did God know Naomi was going to lose her husband? Did God know they would end up going back to Bethlehem? My guess is there were certain 
things that God did to push them gently in that direction that they may not have seen, right? I talked to you before about how I ended up at this church instead of another because there was a hurricane that came right when I was going to interview at a different church. And it blocked that interview. And no kidding, the very next week, the leaders of this church called me and we set up kind of our third interview. And he, it was an interesting conversation because <laughs> the, the leader of the search committee said, we'd like you to come and, and, and uh, receive a call from the church. And I was like, so you want me to come and interview? They said, no, we just want you to be our pastor. Never had been here, never had met anybody but on the committee by Zoom. And yet we knew God was calling that to happen, right? Okay, so just a reminder, that's the story of Ruth. We're at the point now where she had, she had been uh, working in Boaz's field. Boaz was an older, wealthy landowner. And the, the Hebraic society, as you remember, that there was part of their culture that the poor, after they had taken some of the barley and cut it down, the remains, the poor could come and gather for their own needs, Right? And Boaz had taken such an appreciation to Ruth that he was loading her up to take a lot of food back to her and Naomi, right? Okay, now I, I, I want to just take those few 10 minutes to get us caught up on where we need to be as we move into Ruth 3, for those of you that weren't able to make it at previous weeks. So we're going to look at Ruth chapter 3, and a reminder again, I, it's important to remember, that this book happens during the Day of the Judges, and what does it tell us about the book of Judges? The final verse says, In those days Israel had no king, they did whatever they saw fit. Meaning there was no true rule of God or anyone else over their lives. So it was truly chaos in what was going on. And yet within the chaos, God's providence is working in a simple, impoverished uh, woman and her her daughter-in-law. So, as we get into it, Ruth chapter three. One day, Ruth, or one day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, "My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for?" Now, why does Naomi feel that way? Anyone? She's getting older. Naomi can't do anything for her. They're living in poverty. And didn't Naomi pray a number of chapters earlier that God would provide a husband for Ruth? Remember that? And so Naomi's kind of taking it on her own to say, okay, we got to do something about this and get this process going. And so in, in verse 2, Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley in the threshing floor. Now, real quick, let me explain what that means. There were a number of steps to the process of collecting barley. I share this with you as one who has studied it, not one who has ever done it myself, okay? But they would go through the process and the final part after they had cut it and collected it and bound it, the final part was they would take it to what was called the winnowing or the threshing floor. And it was an elevated place. Have you ever been to the beach and there's just this wonderful wind blowing through the whole time. Has anybody ever experienced that? Right? It's that type of thing. We're at the end of that, se in that season, in that time of early spring, there was a wonderful wind that would blow through and they would take these rake-like things and throw the barley up in the air and the wind would blow away what was called the chaff, the worst, worthless part of the barley. And then the seeds would fall to the ground. And that was the process of what was called winnowing the barley. Now, it's interesting for us, just as a quick side note, that in Psalm chapter 1, God uses this metaphor for us. He talks about, he says, uh, the person who follows after the Lord is like a tree planted by streams of water. They will yield fruit in their lives in season. What they do will prosper. But not so those who are wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. So God even uses this illustration in Psalm 1 to show us how when the, the seed goes up, the chaff is blown away. In other words, that's worthless. In other words, the things that wicked people do is worthless and blown away. 
and all that remains is what's important, the seed of people's lives. So, all right. So that, that's what they did. They were on an elevated area. The wind blew it away, and it kind of set it apart. This was a time of celebration, right? If you were a farmer, and you just collected your crop, and you knew it was a great crop, and you were going to feed people and make money, you're ready to celebrate, right? So this is a huge time of celebration. Remember, there was a famine for the year or two before that, or years before that. So they are extremely excited of what they have now. And so in this time of celebration, it says, Tonight, Boaz will be with the winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put your best clothes on. Now, why would Naomi tell Ruth that she should get all, in the old expression, dolled up for this process? She's trying to play matchmaker, right? How many of you remember the old uh, musical uh, Fiddler on the Roof? Remember? So matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. So y'all want to sing it now, right? <laughs> it was all about that old lady matchmaker who tried to hook up person A with person B from the different families and try to bring them together. I told my kids that's how we're going to roll. They don't agree with me, but that's how we'll roll the Kirk house. And so the matchmaker brings them all together. And so Naomi's trying to play that role because she loves Ruth. And she doesn't want Ruth to be living in poverty with her the rest of her life. And so she's trying to set up this type of matchmaking thing with this fella, Boaz. Now, we don't know exactly. Ruth, Ruth is probably about 35, give or take, somewhere around there. Boaz is probably about 55, give or take, somewhere around there. So he's a much older man to Ruth. So just keep that in mind as we walk through some of this. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, perfume yourself, and put on the best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you're there until he finishes eating and drinking. Now, why do you think that's important? <laughs> I, I don't know if he was drunk, but let's just say they were celebrating, okay? And so he, he was definitely in high spirits minimally, right? Okay? He, what's that? And feeling no pain, right? Now, it was too late to send her home. It was too late to send her home, right? Mm hmm. And so, well, she will keep his feet warm, yes. <laughs> There's going to be this unusual moment here, but we're not going to get to that quite yet. But when he lies down, note the place where he is lying down. It was normal for all those people that worked in the barley fields after the final celebration at the end of the harvest, to lie kind of with their heads on the barley piles and their feet out. Because why would you do that? What's that? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. A pillow, yes. Bam, that's it. So nobody, come, it's, I think that's true, but also so that nobody can come take your stuff. It was a way of protecting what they had just gotten and what they had just done. So if you could pick a giant barley pile, picture that in your mind, and there were men sleeping around the outside of each barley pile, protecting it as they were uh, in very good spirits, we'll just say. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Now, let's be honest. That's a pretty weird plan, isn't it? I mean, I know we're not in that culture. We don't exactly get it. But even for this culture, that was a weird plan to ask. How are you feeling if you're Ruth and this is the game plan your mother-in-law tells you? Go lie down quietly next to him, uncover his feet, and wait for him to do something. How are you feeling right there? A little bit uncomfortable, right? I was, <laughs> what's that? Quite a bit uncomfortable. That is an odd plan. So why is Naomi setting her up with what could be a very awkward encounter? Not to mention just a little bit dangerous. Because if Boaz, now we learn that he's a man of character and ethics, but if he wasn't, that could be a very dangerous situation, couldn't it? And so why is Naomi encouraging Ruth to risk it all right now at this moment? 
she feels confident that Boaz will, whether he receives her or not, will treat her well. Okay? Anyone else? Right. They had, they had already had some interactions. We'll just call it flirting, for lack of a, a better term, that was going on. Right. So Naomi had hoped that that flirting was going to lead to something. Right? So on a scale of... What's that? Yes. That's a great thing to bring up is that throughout this story, though the book is called Ruth and it focuses on Ruth, we see the growth of faith in Naomi too, don't we? I mean, remember when she came back to Bethlehem, was she coming back full of faith, ready to do great things? No, she changed her name to mean bitterness and broken, right? Saying, call me someone who is bitter and broken because my life has fallen apart. And so God had to rebuild her also. And so sometimes in God's providence, when we're halfway through the story, we can be in a broken place. In fact, I would argue often. Yeah, John, Jim. Okay, that is true. It's also two steps ahead of where I was. <laughs> but you are right about that. But give me just a second to get to that. Do you think Naomi was in God's will? Do you think Naomi knew for certain that she was in God's will? So what does that tell us about our own lives? That there's an aspect of faith to everything we do, right? Naomi didn't know the end of the book, right? We can look here and go, oh, well, obviously Boaz, da 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 he was he's a good man and all that. But Naomi was just taking a shot, right? Throwing a dart at the board and hoping it would work. But she did it in faith. And so there's times when just like Naomi, we can be in a place of brokenness that the Lord allows us in, knowing what he's going to bring us through if we're faithful to holding on to him. Kyle's. It was very unusual. In a moment, I'll show you where in the scriptures this practice comes from, but it was not a normal thing that people did. Um, a woman being this aggressive was very strange and unusual. Not unheard of, but very unusual at that time. So this was not a normal practice. You know, men didn't wake up and find a woman at their feet all the time, right? <laughs> that would be kind of weird. Yes. Right. That part was not uncommon, but the woman initiating it was. The normal practice in the Hebrew society at that time, a man would, would go to the female's family and ask what kind of dowry they wanted and such, and then they would make the connection if they thought it was a good connection. But here we have a woman initiating the process. Even though we saw Boaz perhaps flirting with her, he saw himself as probably at least 20 years older than her, and we're going to find out later, really assumed that they were not a match at that time. Uh, either one, that's fine. Yep. I think you could draw that illustration. I do think it's a bit of a stretch, but I, I can't say it's wrong either. Um, like the story of, of Ruth, I, I feel stands on its own, but it's certainly probably, I assume you're reading from your Orthodox Bible, which has the ancient fathers. And the fathers were very 
in tune with drawing Christian principles out of Old Testament concepts. And so while I think it's accurate, we also have to realize that when Ruth was written, that's not the purpose for why it was written. But we're, we're reading our Christian faith into that then. Again, accurately, but it, it's not what was exactly written in Ruth at the time. So yes. Now, and just as a quick thing, it, it may not have been caught by you, but remember, Ruth was a widow, right? And there was a significant time of mourning that every widow went through. There was no exact, I mean, there was no exact time that they, they finished that mourning. And by Ruth dressing herself up nicely and presenting herself well and going through this process, she was presenting herself to Boaz as a woman who was ready to be remarried. Because Boaz may not have known that at the time. She may have still been in mourning at the time. So, all right. But again, the biggest thing we want to catch from this is how God's providence is working in their lives by decisions that we are making. I can't speak for you, but I've come across Christians who almost make their Christianity inept because they feel like they just have to wait until they hear from the Lord before they do anything. Has any, have you ever, anybody ever met people like that or am I the only one? So where it's like, well, I'm just going to wait for God to speak. I'm just going, sometimes God's saying, just go and I'll lead you along the way. When, when he led his people in Israel throughout the wilderness, he would then move before them and lead them on the way, right? But they had to get up and go. It was part of the process. And so sometimes God says, I want you to get up and go. And if you're not going the right way, I'll stop you, Right? All right, you guys are quiet tonight. It's messing with me. All right. So let's move on to the next section, uh, verse 5. I will do whatever you say, Ruth said. Do you remember what word we used to describe Ruth throughout all these weeks so far? Obedience, obedience humil what, hum, humility. Humility and obedience is how we mark Ruth. And Ruth, uh, whatever you say, Ruth answered. And again, she's asking her to do a pretty weird thing. Ruth is a Moabite. Does she have any background at all with the Hebrew culture? Yeah. None. And all of a sudden, your, your mother-in-law says, I want you to go to this guy, sneak up on him, uncover his feet. I mean, I, that's a weird ask, isn't it? I mean, really. And so, and what's going to happen? You know, and so, and I share that with you because there will be times that God asks us to do unusual, even uncomfortable things for him. Yes? He will do that because it's an act of what? Faith. It's an act of faith in being obedient. And as Ruth is putting her trust in Naomi, so the Lord invites us to put our trust in him, even when it's a challenging act of faith. So yeah, they're, they're, not only are they Gentiles, but they're Gentiles that hate Israel. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you remember in back to chapter one, the, the Moabites, those people, they were rejected from ever going into God's temple. And so they, yeah, they, they were, they were like dismissed by the Lord. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, so she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. I'd like to insert awkwardly, but that's not in the Bible. But just, when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits. <laughs> so that's where we don't know how good spirits, we don't know. But he was feeling pretty good, right? It was a celebration and they were doing their thing and he sits down, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly. She uncovered his feet and she laid down. Now at that moment, what was Ruth thinking? Just hypothesis what do you think she was going through her head <laughs> nervous what, what? <laughs> i hope naomi's right <laughs> right <laughs> right so there's moments that god asks us to do things that are enormously uncomfortable amen, amen. and a reminder by ruth's obedience she'll end up with boaz who will one day be the mother and father of a lineage that leads to king david and to the messiah because she was willing in faith to do something that was truly countercultural to her at that time. And what's that? 
She didn't wash his feet. No, she did not. Uh, and they probably smelled a bit from working all day, <laughs> if we're going to be honest about it. Yeah. Terry, were you going to say something? Yeah. She was just obeying, being obedient and saying yes. That's really good. That what was being asked of her was so huge, she simply in faith had to say yes, really not comprehending probably even the full uh awesome, awesomeness of what was being asked of her. And so yeah. You may, you, yeah, and really Naomi's all she has. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to trust somebody, that that too. And, and quite frankly, we didn't talk about it, but the trip back to Bethlehem was a hazardous trip. I mean, anybody could have attacked them along the way, and so that must have built such a camaraderie over the decade they were together and all the time they were together. And uh, the trust she had in Naomi is truly, truly amazing. That's true, that she, she desired what was best for Ruth, just as Ruth desired what was best for Naomi. Mm -hmm. And so it made for a tremendously loving relationship between the two of them. We're, we're going to get to that in just a minute. The answer is yes, but we're going to get to why that was a kind of a muddy issue right here at this time. But you're right. It, it, custom is maybe not the best word. I would leave it at opportunity. Because remember, this was happening during the time of Judges where what? There was no king and everyone did what they wanted. So there was no like official, like godly law that was ruling the land at that time. I mean, quite frankly, if we want to look at America, that's where we're at right now. I'm not trying to over politicize anything, but just where people are choosing to do what they want, when they want, and creating kind of a law amongst themselves, right? And so that's where we are at, where you're not even allowed to hold to any type of morals, be they Christian or other, and people will tell you you're wrong, right? Okay. So Ruth approached him quietly. What was that? What was that? Are you just trying to heckle or are you? Okay. Paul, if they act up, please take care of that for me back there. They're, they're the rowdy bunch back there. So for those of you online, that would be Shelly and Mandy who are acting up <laughs> during a Bible study where deep truths are being taught. All right. You spent too many day, too much time, Shelly, in an office at 85 degrees today. It gets us loopy. Gets us loopy, yeah, okay. The air conditioning's down in the building over there, so uh, so uh, thankfully James provided some type of air conditioner for us. All right. Ruth approached quietly. She uncovered his feet, and she laid down. And just as a quick little note, not that it's that important, but in the book of Daniel, and I won't go to it, but in the book of Daniel, let me find it, chapter 10, verse 6, it this Hebrew term means to kind of pull the blanket over, like off of the feet up to about the uh, knees or so. So it's not just the feet, but uh, like kind of off the knees. And, and let's be frank, if you were lying in bed and it was a nice cool or a nice cool evening and somebody gently pulled the blanket off your feet and, and, uh, and lower legs, would you eventually wake up from that? Probably, eventually. <laughs> You, you, you Josh, like 20 hours later, I'd wake up. Yeah, no, most of us would wake up over time because you feel a chill, right? You feel what's going on. And so we don't know how long and how awkward Ruth sat there waiting to see what was going to happen. And I just want to offer that that speaks to us once again in the spiritual realm, that when God asks us to do things, so often we long for him to show us the answer right away. But sometimes we just have to be faithful and wait and see what he's going to do. And so here is Ruth. She lays down at his feet in the middle of the night. Now, if somebody else would have seen her there, what would they have thought? <laughs> she was, if you didn't hear that, she was a hussy. 
That, that was the answer. I like that. She, uh, that is the nice way of saying it. You are 100% right. So. Yeah, well, yeah, but that's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other, a little, a little bit. Now, I agree. She had shown herself as a virtuous woman, but still in the middle of the night, a man who we won't say was drunk, but was in good spirits, as the Bible says, and you're lying at his feet, pulling the cover off of him. So in other words, you have no problem if in the middle of the night, some woman comes up and pulls the cover off of your body, right? I don't even, I'll see Terry finding the gun in the other room and that's what's going to happen. And so, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, no one's going to know about it. <laughs> so, right. right. Mm-hmm. Probably a month, maybe yeah. something like that. A month and a half. Yeah. Right. She's a widow, but he's also an extremely wealthy landowner, right? So what would we say about that in our culture? Gold digger, right? Now, I, I'm still with Greg where I believe Ruth's character hopefully would have spoken for her. But we also know, even in our modern day, that people love to find gossip about other people. That's true. That's true. She was not a cougar, right? We're we're good with that. Wow. Their standards and everything. Yeah, right. That's true. Boy, this thing has taken a far right turn. And <laughs> Jim, I saw your hand up, and then over to Terry. Yes. <laughs> Because it was a party. That's what it was. It was a party. <laughs> Can we at least all agree that it was an awkward situation to say the least? Right? All right, Terry, what were you going to say? All right, but... But can showing favor look like pursuing or flirting? So, so I'm just throwing it all together that Ruth was in a horribly awkward situation. And she put herself there because she trusted this woman that loved her named Naomi. There's no more... Well, everyone judges by their own standard. Well, she was on Yeah. No, I, I'm, a, I'm agreeing with you, Greg. I'm just, I, I'm saying that there are other people who would long to view it differently. Other people that may have been pursuing Boaz and people like that. He was an extremely wealthy landowner, you know? They're hard to find there, right? So, yeah. All right. Well, that took a funny turn. Okay. Let's get into this. So she approached him quietly, uncovered his feet and laid down in the middle. Again, this is not an encouragement if you're trying to tell daughters or granddaughters how to find a man. All right. We're not saying go find a man, pull the blanket off his feet and see what he says. That is not what we are encouraging right now. So uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the night. So she's waiting there for quite a while, right? In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Now, in the words of my daughter, awkward, you know? <laughs> I mean, that, that is really awkward, isn't it? All of a sudden, he finds this woman lying at his feet with half of his blanket off of him. Now, that is a very awkward situation. What do you think was going through Boaz's mind before he even realized who it was? What in the world? Who said all right? 
Wow, it's going to be a long night on the couch for my brother Jim. Okay. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you can stay in, in the room three if you like tonight, brother. You're welcome. So, yes, Derek. <laughs> I, I would say that afraid is okay, but startled is a better word. You can see how both words are very close. They're not that far. As long as you understand afraid meaning like shocked, you know, kind of like horror movie. Ha! Ah! You know, kind of. Yeah, well, I, I certainly would be very uh, concerned at that point. Yes. First of all, I'd wonder how they got in the house in the first place. But then from. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Amen. I agree with that. So, and you all thought the Bible was boring. <laughs> Wait till we study Song of Solomon. Just kidding. Okay. All right. And we move on. He said, who are you? So, you know, remember, were there a lot of lanterns, uh, uh, street lights, and, and everything out? No, it's dark, right? There's no electricity. There's nothing out there. It's just dark. And so all he sees is a figure that he can tell is a woman lying at his feet. Very strange situation. So he says, who are you? She says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. Now, that term is, might be strange to some of us. Let me take a moment and explain what the word, now some of you might have a different translation, but kinsman redeemer is kind of the more normal translation. First of all, to be a kinsman redeemer, this is what it means. First of all, you had to be related. You had to be kin, okay? Kins, men, make sense? So, you, so he was somehow, whether it was a distant uncle, cousin, whatever, related to Naomi and her husband. Was he related to Ruth? No. Not at all, except through marriage, right? So that's a very distant relation to start with. Thin but he, line. what's that? Thin line. Very thin line, but he was a, a, a relative in some sense of the word. Okay, so the only way you can be a kinsman redeemer was that you had to be the same family. Second of all, you had to be willing to be a kinsman redeemer. It was not forced upon you. And we'll learn why in just a moment. So you can be a kinsman redeemer and be like, thanks, but no thanks. All right? It has to be a choice. It couldn't be forced on you. Thirdly, there's four parts to it. Thirdly, you had to be able to redeem. Now you might say, what does that mean? You had to actually be able to follow through on the redemption. You had to have the financial uh, wherewithal to be able to take care of the person that you're the kinsman of and you'd be taking in. So you had to be able to, not only you had to be their kin, you had to be willing and you had to have the finances to be able to take care of them. And then finally, you had to pay the full price for them. There was no such thing as a partial redemption. He couldn't just flip her a couple of coins and say, you're good. So when it came to being a kinsman redeemer, unless the full price was paid, there was no redemption for that person. So when Naomi sends Ruth to Boaz, they were very distant relations. And the hope was that since they were connected to family, that, that he would embrace her and take her on to be his wife. Now, before we go any farther, let me read to you why that was the case. Before we even get into it, let me ask you, why do you think that was even a law? Because I'm going to show you the scripture. It was a law that, that the kinsman redeemer was allowed to then take on the, the relative. Why do you think they even made that a law? It's an odd law, isn't it? That's good. Is first of all, the transfer of property could only go from man to man. I didn't make the rules. Not the same now. That's what was going on in that culture at the time. And it wasn't just the Bible culture. That was the world culture at that time. It transferred from man to man. So if your husband died, did you have any rights to the land you were living on? Only if you had sons. Because if you had sons, then it could pass to who? The son, right? But if you didn't have sons... What's that? I'm sorry, He could kick her out because it was now his land, right? Wow. Imagine if you had like an eight-year-old who got it. You'd have to start treating them differently, wouldn't you? 
kicks mom out, man, lose the discipline. Anyway, so first of all, it was important for the transfer of land, which you might say, why is that a big deal? But as we brought up, you could just be kicked out. And so it was, a, it was actually a very loving law that was there to protect people. Any other reasons why you think that they may have put this law in place? What's that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry Carlos. To keep the family going? To keep the family line going, right? That's one thing they talk about, if you remember, if we jump ahead to the book of Samuel, where God had rejected Saul as king and was going to make a new dynasty through who? David. And so Saul and his son Jonathan were both killed in battle, killing the family line. Remember? And then we talked about Mephibosheth, who was like a side son and, and so forth. All right, well, let me read to you. I know this is weird stuff, so I'm going to show you how it actually was a loving thing at that time that God put into kind of the rule book of, what, uh, of his laws. It's found in Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25. And in chapter 25, verse 5 and 6, let me read to you uh, this law here. If brothers are living together, together and one of them dies without a son, that's what happened here, right? Ruth had no children. His widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her. Now, why was that a problem in Ruth's case? The other brother was dead, right? So there's no other brother. So we have a problem here. They must fulfill the duty of the brother-in-law. Now, <laughs> read into that as you like, but I'm sure brothers wanted to make sure they married somebody that was pretty cool, you know. <laughs> Because <laughs> you never know what would happen in those days. And so, yeah. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out of Israel. So, however, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders of the town gate and say, my husband's brother refuses to carry on my brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty. And the elders of the town shall summon him and talk to him. And if he persists, and so forth. So... <laughs> You see a problem? <laughs> yes, it would be. Solomon had 20 or 200. Yeah. I didn't write the book. <laughs> Remember, back, back in that day, it, uh, marrying multiple wives was not, I'm not going to say it, it was normal, but it wasn't that unusual of a thing that happened. It was not normal, but it, it was not unusual. And so the brother would then take this woman on as the, a second wife. They'd have a child, and that child would then get the land that the brother or the older brother had. Uh, so the land passed to that son then. It protected the woman, it protected the family, and it protected the lineage all the way around. So, and if you think about it, it's actually a, a, a very loving law because if Paul had three brothers and they all had a lot better land than him, what would he have to do to get it if that wasn't a law? Take them out, right? Hey, look at that. I got four times the land. How about that? I'm good to go. He does have three brothers. That was not a prophecy in any way. So just for the record. All right. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, boy, we are just flying off here. This is your first time with us. You just, do you see what I have to deal with here on a normal Wednesday night? <laughs> Trying to preach the Bible and I got all this stuff to deal with, man. I do love it. I, I love chaos, controlled chaos. I truly believe that's why God made me a youth pastor first. If I can handle 100 youth, you guys are a piece of cake. So we're good to go. <laughs> Okay, so let's keep moving on so we can uh, hopefully get through this chapter because I want to finish up next week. So, uh, so Ruth is there. Uh, the idea, just so you're aware, I think this is kind of a neat picture real quick, and I think it's important. She says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are my kinsman redeemer. So when she pulled the blanket partially up or the whatever it was, the, the blanket, we'll just call blanket. If he would then put it upon her, he was saying, I will accept your your desire to want to come together in marriage so it actually was a powerful moment wasn't it but what's neat and i, I think it's really cool is that same 
Hebrew phrase that, uh, at least in my Bible, says, spread the corner of your garment over me. Some translations may have spread the wings of your garment over me. Both trans Do some of you have that? Because that, that, that's, uh, that's actually, I think, actually a clearer uh, uh, translation than the other. But if you take a moment and you go to the book of Ezekiel, oh, let me flip my, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8 you're going to get a picture of how God uses the same phrase to show how he covers us. And it's a beautiful thing. It said, God is talking about his people and how his people had become unfaithful. And he said, later I passed by. And when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough, meaning God's people had, had been developed, I spread the corner of my garment or the wings of my garment over you and I covered your nakedness. Nakedness here is a term for um, rebelliousness, okay? Just to be clear. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into covenant with you, declares the, the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. So it's, it is not reading too much in the text to say that when you gave your life and said, Jesus, I am broken and I need you to save me, that this understanding of this verse was you coming to him and him spreading the wings of his garment over each one of us and saying, you're part of my covenant and you are mine. You are now part of what Revelation calls the bride of Christ. You are part of the new covenant. So it's a, a fantastic picture, friends. What's happening with Ruth and Boaz, also we see prophetically, is what God does for every believer. Yes. I would say that that's one example of it. I, I think the, the act itself of the grace of God covering us is it, but that's the seal of it. If you're, yeah, if you're not familiar, when we baptize people here, whether it's young or old, we say, and we seal you in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's a longer phrase, but it's the idea that he has now placed you under his covenant of protection and that you are his. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It's the exact same terminology in Ezekiel, and it certainly applies to us as New Testament Christians of what God does for us. All right. So why would a kinsman redeemer not want to take on, not, in the, not necessarily in this case, but in any case, why would they not want to take on someone like Ruth? Finances, first of all, because now half of what you have has to go over to them. That's one. because you may have wondered about her ethnicity and who she really is. I mean, he really doesn't know her that well, right? He's seen her character. He's seen her humility, but it's only been for a month. I mean, how many of us got married after a month? Yeah, well, you, you're a Baptist. We don't count that. So anyway, but <laughs> you got married after a month of knowing Jim? Three? Well, that's plenty of time. Yeah, no problem. You're that, you're that good of a catch, Jim. I get that. And so, yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyone else? Yeah. Because he didn't have children. Because he didn't have children as far as we know, right? Wouldn't he want his first son to take his name, not the other son? Right. And see, that's the catch. Is if you're a kinsman redeemer and you have three sons, are you going to want to take on a woman and have a son with her? And again, I know all this is weird for our American ears. I get that. But I want us to catch the spiritual concepts behind what, what we're talking about here. Okay? Because if, what we do in America may be weird 100 years from now, right? So thing, cultures change, things change. Other parts of the world, things we do here are very odd and different. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. And if you remember way back, just uh, we don't have much time, but for not too, too much to tangent. But if you remember when Abraham and God had promised him that he would have Isaac, what happened first? Right? He didn't trust that God would do it. And so his slave girl, he had a son with her name Ishmael. Remember? And they ended up fighting because uh, Sarah, who was Abraham's wife, knew that he would get the rights of the firstborn, right? And they didn't want to have to split them, 
And so eventually Ishmael was sent off at uh, Sarah's desire. So, all right, let's try to keep flying through this a little bit. Uh, the Lord bless you, daughter, he replied. The ki your, this kindness is greater than that which, which you showed earlier, meaning the kindness he, she showed to Naomi. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid, which implies to us that Boaz is what? Older, right? That he's older, right? It just shows that he's older. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. Now, how good did that sound to her at that moment? <laughs> right? All right. Yes, God's providence working through. Because you can't tell me Naomi wasn't having all night intercession that night when she was there, right? And so all of a sudden, God's providence working together. He said, all my fellow townsmen know that you're a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there's a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Whoa, something just got thrown into the pot here. Boaz isn't the first choice to redeem Ruth. The writer of Ruth is letting us know that this marriage made in, in God's perfect paradise might have a, a bit of a problem in it. Because there, there's a cl closer relative than Boaz. And so Boaz, being a man of integrity, is going to do what? The right thing. And he has to go and ask permission of the other man to know if it's okay that he takes Ruth. So he says, stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good. Let him redeem you. But if, you can't tell me it was that simple, that he was kind of like, if he wants to redeem you, tough break. You know, I think, <laughs> we get the short version in scripture, I think, sometimes. It says, but if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. Why do you have her lie there till morning? was not safe for her to go out. He was looking after her protection. Yeah, all the other high-spirited <laughs> men. We didn't need them out there seeing Ruth. Right. So, so she laid at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could, be, could recognize her and said, he said, don't let it be known uh, that a woman came here to this threshing floor. Now, why was it important that no one no, knew Ruth was there? Because she was virtuous. Now, I get that this was pre-Twitter days, okay? But if we could put it in our modern context, if someone saw Ruth, that was going viral. There were going to be memes made up of Ruth sneaking away, right, with some kind of little funny comments on it, right? Word would have gotten around really quick. Twitter and Facebook back then was called old married women. No offense. No offense. Anybody? Man? Okay. But women like to do what? Gossip. I made you guys say it, not me. So that's good. No, right, Billy? No one can claim I said it. I didn't say it. No, I made them say it. That's right. And so he did not want Ruth's name to be disparaged at all. Not to mention it could affect the way he approaches this other man about whether he was going to take Ruth or not, right? Because that other man would be like, well, I heard she spent the night with you, right? And that creates a very difficult situa situation, especially for a, a godly man of integrity, right? Okay, let's try to zip through the last few uh, verses of this. Verse 15, he also said, bring me a shawl that you are wearing and hold it out. When he did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her, and then he went back to town. Why did he do that? Take care of her, right? Took it back to Naomi. And plus, let's be frank, it looked less awkward, didn't it? If she's walking, they probably thought she just fell asleep somewhere with the women and she was walking back carrying that barley. Okay. After Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley. And just so you know, that was enough to feed at least for a week. So he gave her a hearty amount of, of uh, barley. Because I know not all of us are up on our barley quotients, right? And knowing exactly, going to Whole Foods and everything, getting our barley amounts. Uh, don't go back, uh, uh, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. 
Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the men, man will not rest until the matter is settled. Final thought for the evening. Sometimes God tells us just to act. And that's what Naomi did, right? Her prayer was that she'd find a godly man for Ruth. And so she didn't just sit back. She said, Lord, this may be what you're doing, and I'm going to risk in faith that you're doing this. But now they're in a time when they have to wait. And sometimes when we do something and act for the Lord, we have to wait to see what he's going to have happen. And I'm really not sure which is harder. You want me to share me your thoughts. Is it harder to risk or harder to wait? I think the waiting, yeah. Don't you? I mean, I, the risking ain't easy, isn't easy either because sometimes God asks us to do some strange things. But the risking, have you ever sent a text or an email or a letter or something to somebody that, that you just weren't sure how they were going to react and you had to kind of wait to hear for their reply? I mean, that's kind of where we're at right now. Some of us aren't, young, aren't old enough to know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so no, I, I know, I know. And so what we see here is that sometimes God just wants us to, well, sometimes God wants us to go, and sometimes he tells us that we're to wait. There's a really, really neat Christian song, and it came out like 15 years ago. Uh, it's called, Where You Go, I'll Go, and When You Say, I'll, when you say Stay, I'll Stay. And I thought, what a, a powerful truth in that verse. That when God says go, we go. And if God isn't saying anything, I would argue if wisdom says go, what should you do? Go. go. The whole time waiting to see if Lord maybe tells you to stop and then being willing to stop. But we often say, well, I'll just wait until God shows me. Well, sometimes he just wants you to go yeah. and to go for it. He wanted you to go for it and start a grief ministry, right? Put you and Mary together and you started one, right? Yep, exactly. And you went with it. And so sometimes he says, wait and stay. And that's what's going on here. And it's one of the more challenging times when he asks us to wait. So uh, last thought for the, the evening. Let me just read to make sure I get this right. <laughs> okay. What we see here is God showing us a picture of himself as kinsman redeemer. I shared with you how a kinsman redeemer, you had to be kin, you had to be willing, you had to be able to redeem, and you had to pay a full price. I'd like us to take just a moment and bring this into the New Testament, into our covenant with the Lord. First, Jesus had to become kin. He had to become like us. Philippians says he became in appearance as a man. As God, he could not just come and say, he had to become like us to represent our side of the covenant. But as God, he represented God's side of the covenant. And so he became like us. Secondly, he was willing to do it for us. In Philippians, it says, he made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. And John 10 says, no one, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down by my own choice. He chose and was willing to come and save us and become like us because of his great love for us. Thirdly, he was able to redeem because he was the sinless savior. So he had, in a sense, the financial backing as a kinsman would, he had the spiritual backing to save us. And finally, Jesus paid the complete price for our redemption. And Titus 2 says, He gave us his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and make us his very own people. The beautiful thing about our redemption is that it is a complete redemption and nothing is needed by us to bring it to pass. That Christ has bought our redemption for us. Amen. And so the scripture you will see, Jesus became our kinsman redeemer, just as Boaz was for Ruth. 
And so, as much as this is a, a beautiful Old Testament story with spiritual principles, it carries New Testament weight for us, for all of us who have allowed him to be our kinsman redeemer and save us from sin. Amen. Amen. And so next week we will finish up the book with chapter 4 of Ruth. I know you can read ahead so it takes away the excitement. It's not like I can make you wait till next week's episode. But uh, anyway, but it, we'll see how all this turns out and then the final part of it all. So anyway, thank you everybody. I hope you have a good week and I hope to see you on Sunday. And if not, I'll see you on Wednesday if you can.